Welcome back to Business Matters with me, Roger Hearing, and my guest today, Madhavan Narayanan and Michael Hudson. Now, Michael, you are, as we said at the beginning, a new guest. We haven't had you on the programme before, and it's sort of a tradition that we introduce you a bit. So, uh, I mean, we obviously know that you write books. Um, how did you come to be in this position uh, of writing books about economics and uh, this kind of thing? Where, where, where are you from, to start with? Well, in the 1960s, I was the balance of payments economist for Chase Manhattan Bank. And my job was to uh, estimate how much uh, uh, Latin American countries could afford to borrow. And you looked at uh, what's their ability to pay. And I found they were already all loaned up. Uh, and then in the late 60s, I was asked to calculate how much Britain could pay. Ah, yes. And there was no way that I could see Britain taking on any more debt uh, and being able to repay under current and, and, uh, conditions. And yet, surprisingly, they, they did. Well, but just, just before we get into They the... were lent the money to pay. Well, the, it, the, US, the government, uh, the U.S. government and the IMF had to lend them the money, uh, and they had to devalue. Uh, I'd expected them to devalue. Uh, that uh, was the day that uh, uh, the prime Minister uh, Harold Wilson came and promised uh, not to uh, devalue the pound. And my friends at Citibank said that's a sign they're going to devalue this weekend oh. and sold uh, all the pounds. Uh, Chase bought them and Citibank sold them. Well, there we are. An example of, of your experience in the past when, uh, when, when with dealing with the subject of debt. But before we get on to I just want to push even further back if we can. How did you come to be work, working for Chase Manhattan? Where, where did you start off? Where are you actually from to start with? Well, I was born in Minneapolis, uh, grew up in Chicago, uh, came to New York uh, and uh, to, went to work, uh, got a Ph.D. in economics. Oh, you, uh, you say got, got a Ph.D. in economics. I mean, these things don't just happen. You, I mean, did you decide at a very early age that economics was just the thing that made you Tick? No, I wanted to be a musician, but I wasn't a very good uh, pianist, uh, ah. and I couldn't afford uh, to be a conductor, so ah, I so had you, to go you, to work you, for a living. So in a, in a different different lifetime, you might have been a concert pianist, something like that? Uh, that would have been my choice, but uh, hmm. the fact is uh, I was I found I was much better at uh, making economic charts and uh, calculating uh, uh, finance than I was in uh, performing A, d- a different music. sort of harmony or music, perhaps, yes. involved in that, do you think? <laughs> do you think there is something maybe at the, the core of that? There's a similarity of needing to be exact about things, perhaps? Uh, That's part of it, and also the idea of modulation. Uh, Things change. Uh, The transformation of the keys and uh, how to stress out, uh, how to uh, uh, stress how we're going from one key to another. There's an evolution, and I looked at the economy as evolving, just like uh, a symphony would evolve from Ah. a a tonic into the dominant and into other keys. Music of the spheres. I mean, is this the times now when you sit down and uh, perhaps to relieve the stress of some economic plan you sit down and play a little something on the piano no it would have taken too much time it takes uh, (laughs) full time to do the uh, economic writing that i'm doing so no more playing for you right well all right let's move on so from that you became as you say you took a phd in economics and then and then did chase manhattan just pick you up and say right you're the man we want uh, yes, and uh, they gave me free reign. Uh, uh, David Rockefeller said uh, I should just say uh, what I believed, and uh, if they uh, liked it, they'd publicize it. If they didn't, they wouldn't, but he wanted me to just make the calculation, and one calculation after another showed that already in the 60s, Latin America couldn't pay more debts, mm. uh, and then I went to work for the United Nations at UNITAR, uh, writing on what, North- what's, what's UNITAR? Uh, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Okay. Uh, and I uh, wrote a number of papers uh, that the third world could not pay any more debts uh, than it had already taken on. And this was in 1979, and I forecast that Mexico couldn't possibly pay. Uh, and there was a riot at the, uh, uh, at the meeting we had in Mexico. And so I decided to write a whole history of how economies had handled uh, their debt problem when they couldn't pay. So, and, uh, so you are kind of someone who knows more probably about international debt than, well, virtually anybody else around, I should think. Well, I managed uh, the first international debt fund in 1990, the Third World mm. Debt Fund uh, for uh, Scudder Stevens uh, in Boston, when uh, Argentina and Brazil were paying 45 percent interest per year well, on their foreign debt. So it was obvious that uh, there, there was a problem. Well, uh, we're talking here about stratospheric debt, huge debt and country debt. But I'm always interested in people who talk a lot about debt. I mean, it's a personal, perhaps intrusive question. Have you ever been in debt yourself? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I took out a student loan when I was in school. I uh, bought a house, uh, my first house uh, with a mortgage loan. Uh, but I... Uh, 
paid off all the debts. Mm. Uh, and fortunately, I grew up at a easy time in the uh, I, in the sixties and seventies when I was working. Anybody at that time could afford to borrow to a money enough money to buy a house of their own, uh, and they didn't have to rent. And it was as cheap to buy a house as it was uh, uh, to rent. And uh, that situation doesn't exist anymore because the the debts that have loaded down real estate are so high that uh, people can't afford to uh, to borrow uh, enough to buy on a normal salary. And if they are unfortunate enough to have taken out a student loan, uh, I had to take out a $500 student loan, but now it would be 50000 They have to pay so much in student loan debt that they can't afford to qualify to buy a house of their own, to start a family. They have to live with their parents. And so the, uh, the debts have grown so high that it is shrinking the economy. All right. Well, I mean, we've talked about, about debt at the personal level, debt at the country level. But you've written a book about how to deal with debt, and it's called And Forgive Them Their Debts. Now, first of all, that, that, that sounds biblical, is it? Yes. Uh, uh, it, it's a history of uh, the ancient Near East and uh, Sumer and Babylonia and uh, how original rulers handled debts. And every ruler who would take the throne in the new Near East for 2,000 years, from the third millennium to the first millennium, would uh, start his rule by a debt amnesty, not for business debts, but for personal debts and for tax arrears. Uh, and this uh, uh, debt amnesty that would uh, cancel the debts and free the bond servants and return lands that had been forfeited, this uh, was taken over uh, by Jewish religion in the Jubilee year, literally word for word from uh, the Babylonian. Okay, so so you, you, you've outlined that this problem obviously goes back a long way, and some people see the solution from that. But what are you proposing now? What what do you say should be done, both at the level of, of the debts of individuals, of course, you know, many, many people, students included, that have huge debts hanging over them, but also at the national level of debt? Should there just be a general debt amnesty in the world? Is that what you're saying? Uh, that would probably be too far. Not uh, Certainly business debts uh, that are viable and can be repaid uh, should be repaid. The, the problem are debts that can't be repaid. Uh, the problems are debts owed like a country like Greece. And the question is, should any country be obliged to shrink itself, uh, to force its labor to emigrate, to find jobs in order to pay uh, the banks or creditors? Something has to give and someone has to lose. So the question is, who are you going to save, the banks and the bondholders or the economy? Well, yeah, as you say, someone has to lose. And in the end, there will be people who have invested money or are trying to, to increase a bit of the money. They've, they've put money in there. They are a victim of this, if you forgive debt, aren't they? Well, it's not really people. Uh, the people are really 1% that we're talking about. Uh, the wealthiest 1% and the banks and the institutions are the main creditors. The 99% of the people are debtors. And you could say, you could look at the economy in terms of the 1% or the 10%, getting the 99% in debt to them. And that's how most wealth is created today. It's not created by increasing output. It's not created by uh, employing labor to make a profit. Profit. It's uh, employed by a financial engineering, which means uh, debt pyramiding. But there is still what we call moral hazard, isn't there? If I if I can borrow money and think, well, I'm never going to have to pay it back, and I, that's. That's not the way that economies should run, is it? Well, I think there should be hazard on other creditors. Take the um, take the banks that made the junk mortgage loans. Uh, before 2008, all of the media were talking about, the, uh, had the words junk mortgage or ninja borrowers, n- uh, no income, no job, no assets. Uh, shouldn't the banks uh, ha- uh, t- risk a hazard if they make a bad loan way beyond the ability of the borrower to pay? That's a bad loan. So and there's no the bank- moral duty duty to pay back money you borrow? Uh, Well, the question is, uh, at what point does it become immoral for the creditor to demand that the debtor uh, and his family lose their home, uh, uh, lose their job, and end up in an economy that's shrinking with unemployment that looks like Greece? Well, let me bring Madhavan in on this, because I sense, Madhavan, that you've got a couple of points, perhaps, of disagreement. Let me me posture that. I mean, what what do Uh, you say? uh, Let me very quickly say that I love Michael Hudson. Uh, a parallel between music and economics as somebody who loves both. There's a counterpoint called 
uh, paying back the loans and there's a point called lending and they have to be harmonized to use a musical metaphor. But beyond that, I think it's very important to realize that farmers in India and students in the U.S. are like vulnerable classes and these are the categories that should be allowed debt forgiveness although in India it's very controversial because farmers tend to commit suicides when they uh, are not able to pay back their loans while uh, wealthy industrialists because they preside over so-called limited liability companies are able to uh, fool the state-owned banking system and enjoy themselves in places like Antigua and uh, London, if I may say so, uh, fugitive barons, as we call them. So I think we have to find a balance somewhere between one extreme kind of moral hazard in lending, that's the stuff that Michael Hudson spoke about, and the other extreme of making vulnerable people uh, uh, accountable. So it's so finding that balance is the issue, isn't it? Exactly. And we need a new philosophy of banking. The Wall Street crisis of 2008 and uh, the uh, Latin American crisis on which Professor Hudson has done a fantastic job, as I can see, are the two uh, main points of understanding. Mm -hmm. We need a Warren Buffett kind of view on debt as well, I suspect. Oh. And I have a feeling Professor Hudson has to be heard by all leading thinkers on well, economics of the world. I'm very impressed. Well, Michael, uh, Michael, you have a fan uh, clearly out there. But at that point about <laughs> distinguishing you. between those who should have their debts forgiven and those who shouldn't, and to most people that will come down, that will be the crux of everything that you're saying. Well, they can look at the big picture. The big picture is in every economy, the debt grows faster than the economy. And the Babylonians had an, a mathematical model that's better than the models that are used today. They calculated how fast debts would grow, and they said no economy can grow as fast as the debts, and if you don't write down the debts, you're going to have the whole uh, population in bondage, and then there won't be any army. They'll run away, just as the Greeks were uh, emigrating. And uh, so the, the question is, do we, we can only survive by canceling the debts, and that's why every ruler uh, canceled the debts, and uh, uh, Socrates discussed this in Greece. Uh, the Greek takeoff was uh, when Solon cancelled uh, uh, the debts and uh, banned uh, debt bondage. And uh, if you look at the modern times, the most successful debt cancellation was the German economic miracle of 1948, when all uh, debts, except for what employers owed their labor force and except for minimum balances, were canceled. And it was easy to do that because most debts were owed to the Nazis. And uh, the cancellation of debts made the German economic miracle. So that could happen today in Greece, Argentina, Italy, uh, uh, and many another place. If you leave the debts on the books, many another place besides, I'm sure. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Clearly, uh, you, it's something you passionately believe in, and uh, I, I suspect there will be many people out there who both agree and disagree with that.